Hello, I'm Sophie Ikenye. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. Lesotho's Prime Minister Thomas Tabane is to be charged with murdering his estranged wife. South Sudan's President Salva Kiir and his rival Riek Machar agree to form a unity government, but can they resolve the sticking points? Togo's President Fo Nyasingbe insists he is not a dictator days before an election in which he seeks a fourth term in office. Also in the a program, football as a source of salvation and reconciliation. We hear from the former Rwandan footballer who's using the game to bring the country together uh, years after pictures of him playing for one of the country's top clubs helped save his life during the Rwandan genocide. One of the soldiers, he realized who I was. Definitely, the, the photos uh, saved my life. And in sports, Manchester United travel to Belgium to face Club Bruges in their Europe League clash with Nigeria's Odion Igalo in the squad. for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Lesotho's Prime Minister Thomas Tabane is to be charged with the murder of his estranged wife, Lipolelo Tabane, according to police. Now, his current wife, Messiah Tabane, has already been charged with the murder. He would be the first leader in Southern Africa to be charged with murder while in office in a case that has shocked the tiny mountain kingdom. Well, earlier today, he announced on the radio that he would step down at the end of July, citing old age. Today I wish to reiterate my announcement to retire from office. I might still have the necessary zeal and fervor to continue saving my people and country, but the truth is that at my age I've lost most of my energy. I'm not as energetic as I used to be a few years ago. In this connection I wish to with all humility announce that I effectively retire as Prime Minister with effect from the end of July this year. Well, let's bring in Pumza Fihlani, who's been following things for us. What's the latest on these quite dramatic developments uh, in Lesotho? We know, Sophie, uh, from what the police have told us um, earlier today, that they intend to arrest the Prime Minister and have him brought to court tomorrow. This is on Friday, where he will be officially charged for murder and also a second charge of attempted murder. This is in connection with the shooting of a lady who was with um, his estranged wife at the time, who survived the incident and is expected to play a key role in the murder trial when it gets underway. Just brief, briefly, let us know, help us understand how we got here. This is a story that dates back to 2017 when Dibulelo Tabane was shot outside her home just in the outskirts of the capital, Maseru. And at the time, the police believed uh, or rather blamed the, the incident on unknown gunmen. The prime minister even commented at the time, describing it as a senseless killing. Um, we know that the police had been quietly investigating uh, the Tabanes, but up until recently only came out directly and said that they intend to charge both the prime minister minister and his wife, who, who is already um, in the court process and is yet to plead. All right. So it appears we have a political situation now in Lesotho. What is the ruling party saying, his party? That's right, Sophie. This is uh, uncharted territory for the people of Lesotho and indeed political parties there. We know that the old Basotho Convention want him out. In fact, had they had their way, they wanted him out as early as today, latest tomorrow. But we know that's not going to happen. He seems to be digging in. He says he will only leave in July, citing that he does not want to leave the party in disarray. We know that there are be behind-the-scenes negotiations on who will succeed him. They feel, um, his party, that he is a political liability and a trial to cut him loose. This is, of course, Sophie, a coalition government, and the other coalition partners want him out sooner rather than later. This has been a huge embarrassment for the people of Lesotho and the government there. And what about the region itself? Because I'm sure they are keenly watching what's happening in Lesotho, Pumza. That's right. In fact, we understand that the Prime Minister was in South Africa this week to come and notify President Cyril Ramaphosa that he intends to step down. We know, though, that from those conversations um, and, and how the Prime Minister has played this entire controversy, he has linked it 
to his L, um, his age, he has made no mention publicly or privately, as far as we understand, that this has anything to do with this murder controversy that he and his wife are facing. It's important to say, though, that he has not um, he has not um, spoken about these allegations, and also that the first lady, Maisaya Tabane, is yet to plead on these charges. So they are presumed innocent until proven guilty. But the people of Lesotho are certainly shocked that they are even implicated in something so sinister. All right. Pumza Fihlani for us there in Johannesburg. Thank you. Now, South Sudan's President Salva Kiir and former rebel leader Riek Machar have agreed to form a unity government. This comes after six years of civil war and two days before a deadline to implement a power-sharing agreement. Now, South Sudan is the world's newest country and gained independence from Sudan in 2011. Two years later, civil war broke out after the president, Salva Kiir, sacked the entire cabinet and accused the vice president, a former rebel leader, of instigating a failed coup. Now, the humanitarian fallout from the civil war has caused almost 400,000 deaths. Four million people have been displaced and more than half of the population are facing severe hunger. In 2018, a power-sharing agreement was signed between the warring parties, but previous agreements have failed, lasting only a few months. Well, joining me to discuss this father is retired Brigadier General Ahmed Mohammed, a senior advisor for defense and security at the Horn International Institute for Strategic Studies. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on Focus on Africa. The big question, obviously, is whether this agreement, this power sharing uh, government will hold because of the previous agreements that have not lasted long. With the sticking points, will they be able to hold? Well, thank you, Sophie. We are looking forward to having uh, this agreement this coming Saturday. And after that, the establishment of the uh, transitional government of national unity. However, there are a number of contentious issues which have not been resolved. And the top of the list is the number of states. We know the states were initially 10. They were built to 32. In the agreement now, they're supposed to be only 10 states. However, we know in the last one week, the government has established three administrative areas, namely Rowang in uh, Unity State, uh, Pibo in Jonglei, and Abye, which have been identified as administrative state. These have been rejected by the opposition. Now, uh, second on the list is the issue of the unified armed forces, which should number 83,000. While that is the case, the key issues are the composition of this army, uh, where they're going to do their training, where they will concentrate, and also the issue of command and control. And then third on the list is the issue of boundaries. We know a number of boundaries are contentious. On top of the list is Malakal and Raja. And finally, Sophie, the issue of the security arrangements and control around Juba, which for a long time have remained a problem. We know in the last two incidents, that was a big issue. We are talking now of possibly establishing a VIP protection force. That is still pending. We are waiting to see what's going to come out of this, Sophie. So, so what happens? What kind of scenario are we looking at if they don't come to agreement on those very important uh, points that you've raised? What you have seen, Sophie, in the past is that when they don't agree, there has been more like uh, uh, a flare of the conflict again. And we have made very good progress so far. We strongly feel that this time, this agreement should hold. Remember? In 2013, there were issues. 2016, there were issues. 2018, there was an agreement, which is still uh, holding to now. We believe this time around, on Saturday, we should see an agreement, Sophie. I'm, I'm quite curious about uh, the concept of former rebels or former military people taking over power and trying to rule in a civilian way. Is it an easy turn to make, really? Well, that is quite uh, an issue, Sophie. And we know that uh, in the past, when rebels come uh, to power, they have stayed on. But where there has been the military coming in, they have done two things. One is to uh, bring stability and then call for elections and they give way. In other situations, they come in, they bring stability, call for elections, and then run for the elections and remain in power. Those are all options that we have seen in the past, Sophie. Mm. There's been pressure from outside, uh, from the region, and of course from, from the United States. Can this country afford not to stay united or not to go through with this agreement now? Sophie, there has been a lot of international pressure, both regional and international. 
EGAD on their part have done very well so far in trying to push this, uh, uh, this move. The AU on their part have equally done a very important role. We know that um, uh, the USA, the EU and a number of international actors have come in to intervene. What we feel this time is that the protagonists should really give way and one of the things to do or consider is to look at limited incentives. Remember, the government of South Sudan is still not fully legitimate in the face of the international community. And for Riyak Machar, remember that he's actually on restrictions in terms of movement. If these two can be released a bit, I'm sure they may possibly give in and we see uh, the agreement fully signed this time around. All right, Brigadier General Ahmed Mohammed, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts on this very important subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Well, let's now take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. A court in Uganda has quashed the sentence of prominent Ugandan academic Stella Nyanzi, who had been jailed on charges of harassing President Yoweri Museveni. The judge said the lower court which jailed her had seen no evidence of cyber harassment. At her trial related to a Facebook post last year, Dr Nyanzi said she'd planned to offend President Museveni because he had offended the country for 30 years. German politicians have condemned Wednesday's deadly far-right attack in the town of Hanau. Nine people were killed in the attack, all were of immigrant background. The suspected gunman, a 43-year-old German, and his mother were later found dead in his home. Prosecutors say the man had produced a deeply racist manifesto and other extremist material. Togo's president, Fo Nyasingbe, insists he is not a dictator days before an election in which he is seeking a fourth term. He might be the front runner in Saturday's poll, but his strongest opposition will be by Jean Pierre Fabre, who was the leader of the protests that forced reforms, especially on term limits for the presidency. Daniel Henry reports. It's not long since protests over President Fauna Sibe's time in office gripped the country, with demonstrators demanding the president resign after 15 years in power. Now he's running for a fourth term in charge. But supporters of the other candidates say he won't get in without a fight. The elections take place in two rounds. Knockout. We, the supporters of the UNIR party, want our champion to win in the first round. Even the state phone company sends us message, vote your sangbe. You know, it is David versus Goliath. Even without the means, the people are willing to vote for us. And we know that on the evening of the 22nd, we will be declared the winner, whether they like it or not. Nasibe pushed through constitutional changes last year so that he can run again, potentially adding another decade to the family dynasty. It is more of a reputation than a reality. A president can't keep up with everything that is going on. It is not that I'm getting sloppy. It is about image. But if you have the time to look at the situation in our country, reading the press and so on, quite honestly, you will see that sometimes those assessments are exaggerated. In any case, I do not feel like a dictator. The United Nations and the economic community of West African states will be watching closely. But critics question if this election will be free and fair after 500 independent election monitors were denied accreditation to oversee Saturday's polls. The Nasibe family has been in power for the last 53 years. Millions are expected to vote this weekend as Togo's people decide if the family legacy lives on or ends here. Daniel Henry, BBC News. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, he may be a Rugby World Cup winning captain, but Sia Colisi tells us what keeps him grounded. Find out more in sports. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top stories on this program. The Prime Minister of Lesotho is to be charged with the murder of his estranged wife. His current wife has already been charged with the murder. South Sudan's President Salva Kiir and his rival Riek Machar agree to form a unity government two days ahead of the deadline. You're watching Focus on Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport. Mimi. 
Thanks, Sophie. The round of 32 begins today in the Europa League with the first leg kicking off in a couple of minutes' time with eight matches. Nigeria's Odion Igalo has been named on the subs bench for Manchester United as they have travelled to Belgium to face Club Bruges. The 30-year-old striker came on as a substitute on Monday with a few minutes to stop its time in their English Premier League tie away to Chelsea. His teammate Andreas Pereira says Igalo has been doing well well in training since coming on loan last month. No, it was really good. Uh, we had really good uh, training sessions over there. We prepared really well. Um, it was good for the team spirit as well. Um, Bruno and, and Odion, they settled in really well. They're really great lads and, you know, and they, they got on board very quickly. And, and now we're very happy that they're with us and they can do really well for us. And in just over two hours' time, another eight matches will kick off. One to look out for will be last season's finalist, Arsenal, who have travelled to face Greek giants Olympiakos. Their coach, Mikel Arteta, says that he will field a, a young team, but strong one. They're going into the match after ending a run of four consecutive English Premier League draws with a 4-0 win over Newcastle on Sunday. Tunisia is the latest country to officially submit a bid to host this year's Confederation of African Football Champions League final. Morocco has also submitted a bid to host the final on 29th of May, but proposed to host the second tier African Confederation Cup final on the 24th of May as well, something Tunisia did not wish to do. South Africa, meanwhile, expressed its interest to host either the Champions League final or the Confederations Cup final. All right, when you are a famous person and you are thrust in the spotlight, how do you keep your feet firmly on the ground? For this famous athlete, the answer is very simple, his wife. Sia Kulisi may be his country's first black rugby captain who led South Africa to win the Rugby World Cup last November. But as he tells BBC Sport Africa's Victoire Ayoum, his wife still makes him do the dishes. We've all been celebrating. How do you like to keep your feet on the ground? And She's right here. <laughs> She's the one. That reminds me every day. Your father, your husband, and you still got to do your chores at home. You know, because uh, sometimes you get stuck in a bubble and you think, you know, you, you're on top of the world. And then you got, I got a strong, independent woman like this who reminds me, hey, you got to do the decisions every now and then. <laughs> no, of course. He, I mean, he's really grounded already. He does an incredible job um, at keeping himself very grounded. He's got a great group of friends that keep him grounded as well. And also his faith, I think, plays a huge part in yeah. who he is and what keeps him grounded. So um, it's really a privilege to do life with him and um, just see how he's grown in this process. I love that. I struggle to get my brothers to do the dishes. That's all the sport. Sophie. <laughs> Mimi, who are you? <laughs> Thanks for the sport. Thank you. Now, it's almost 26 years since the Rwandan genocide, which saw around 800,000 people killed in a space of 100 days. Many more were left badly injured. As part of Crossing Divides, a BBC season bringing people together in a fragmented world, we want to bring you the story of one man who only just escaped with his life. At the time, Eric Murangwa Eugene was an 18-year-old goalkeeper for one of Rwanda's top football clubs. Rayon Sports, uh, let's have a look. Around 1 p.m. local time, when a group of soldiers uh, came into this house, screaming, shouting, and it was, it was very scary. And I could see that his face uh, completely changed as soon as he realized who I was. Definitely, the, the photos uh, saved my life. My name is Eric Murangwa Eugene. I am a former international Rwandan football player, a survivor of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Within a few weeks after, after it started, the ordinary people, they were, were encouraged to be part of the genocide machine. I can remember how great that moment was. Uh, the stadium was 
full to its capacity. When we won the game, people forgot whatever differences that they had at the time, and they celebrated our win as one people. So the soldiers were going around the house, throwing things up and down. Uh, and it was, it was very scary. One of the things that they were throwing up and down uh, happened to be a photo album. Uh, it caught the attention of one of the soldiers. His face uh, completely changed as soon as um, uh, he realized who I was. So for, for the next um, 10 minutes, we, we were talking about football, really. Definitely, the, the photos uh, saved my life. There was a lot of younger people who were uh, uh, grieving and uh, suffering because of the consequences of the genocide. As a pastor, uh, it was a very big challenge to come with religious message to people. But I knew that if I begin with sports, then that would be easier for the youth to listen to me. As you can see, there, there are girls and, and boys mixed uh, together, playing together, learning together. It's a long and hard journey of changing the mindset of people. It will be here for a long time, but uh, I'm pleased on what has already achieved. Now, a priceless and quite heavy, an 18th century Ethiopian crown that was found in a suitcase in the Netherlands by a former refugee has finally been returned home. It's now been handed to Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and will be placed back in its original church. Kalkidani Beltal has more from Addis Ababa. For more than two decades, the rare church crown was kept in an apartment in the Netherlands. Today, the man who found it returned to Ethiopia with the ornate artifact. On the receiving end was Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Sirak Asfaw, who has been living in the Netherlands after fleeing political violence in Ethiopia, says he found the crown in a suitcase in the early 1990s after a visitor to his home left it there. He said that he vowed to keep his safe until he returned to its home. That day arrived and today it's on display at the National Museum here in Addis Ababa. Eventually, it will be returned to its original home in Northern Ethiopia. The 18th century crown is thought to be a gift from a powerful warlord to the church. It's believed there are around 20 such crowns in the world. Ethiopians have been pushing for the return of various stolen artifacts that can be found in different places, particularly in Europe. The returning of this crown can be a catalyst in reigniting that conversation. Kalkida Nibeltal, BBC News, Addis Ababa. Mm. Now, before we go, a quick look again at our top story on Focus on Africa. Lesotho's Prime Minister, Thomas Tabane, is to be charged with the murder of his estranged wife, Lipolelo Tabane. His current wife, Messiah Tabane, has already been charged with the murder. He would be the first leader in Southern Africa to be charged with murder while in office. Today, he announced that he would step down at the end of July, citing old age. Well, don't forget, you can get in touch with me and the rest of the Focus on Africa team on social media. I'm Atsi Kenye. Thanks for your company.